Okay, I'll call the meeting to order at 7.18. Do we have any uh, adjustments to the agenda? We have one, Andrew, and it's just uh, under discussion and uh, possible appointment of a recording secretary. Right. Okay. I think we could do it on like 9.4 even. Sure. All right. Um, I don't have a printout of the agenda, so if somebody could remind me once we get there, that'd be yep. helpful. Okay. Then, um, do we have any public comment at this time? I think most of our public is. Okay. Um, then let's move on. Uh, we have a motion to approve the minutes of Tuesday, June 18th and to Thursday, June 27th. So moved. Seconded. Is there any um, discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I want to make sure I have all Okay. And minutes are approved. Um, we still don't have any public comment. So do we have any board comment? Um, and we're not going to have a celebration of learning this month. Um, and we'll move to the superintendent report. Uh, so you have my report in hand. Um, I would say that, you know, the SU was incredibly um, eventful this summer in the sense of we had students in uh, programming for seven weeks. Um, which was an additional week, which was exciting to be able to expand our programming and intervention for enrichment at the elementary level. We had two really great, actually three really great middle school offerings that we were able to provide. Uh, two that we provided and then another uh, group that came in and used our campus uh, to hold some programming that our kids participated with in at the middle school level. Um, and then you have had teachers from your district engaging in either team meetings and or professional development um, for multiple weeks this summer. Um, you know, I would say, if anything, it's one of these things I just, I, I'm so incredibly excited about the enthusiasm of all this work. I continue to be a little worried about um, how we just make certain folks are truly resetting uh, so that we don't like hit uh, this place of like burnout you know, in February, March time. I just worry about that for some of our teachers who have been really energized and on the go all summer, but I worry about did they actually like refill their buckets. So I share that with the board just to say that's something that I am definitely attuned to and something I want us to get feedback on in regards to some of our climate outreach to just figure out how do we help folks reset and just pace themselves. That's all. It's just, it's just a, it's one of those things, I think it's a celebration about how many folks we have currently um, engaged in work over the summer and getting ready for next school year, but just also making certain that that doesn't result in fatigue in the second half. Um, the other thing I just wanted to remind boards is that if you haven't, and some of you have already, signed up uh, to be at the table at the Tumbridge World's Fair, uh, specifically for you as a district, it is an incredibly, uh, an incredible opportunity of recruitment and speaking with families in regards to school choice. So um, I would say that as a district, I hope that you consider engaging in that opportunity um, because we've had lots of different um, families and, and prospective families um, come through the booths last year. I just expect that to continue to grow. So just a plug in to consider signing up for that. Um, and then the other thing I'll just let you know is I'm, I'm keeping a close eye just on the work, and I've shared this with board members around the um, future of uh, public education for Vermont, that commission, um, in regards to what I think outcomes there could be, I think as a district within our supervisory union, that um, I don't think that there's gonna be too many things that they may discuss that could possibly be too concerning for you as a district in the sense of your uh, scale. I think it is 
going to be in a place where we're not going to be threatened. Um, I do, it's something I'm following very closely for some of our smaller districts within the supervisory union and just some concerns about what that might mean for, for them. Um, so that, that committee meets uh, the next time on Monday, August 26th, which is next Monday already. Um, and I did share their webpage with all of you, but if you just need a refresher or something, just shoot me an email and I can get you that information if you're interested in joining their public meetings. Um, and so I do know we have some board members that have been uh, attending already. And then I'll entertain any questions folks may have. New staff orientation tomorrow at for the SU at the Royalton campus. We're really excited. We've had a we uh, we've tried to make a more robust uh, mentoring program for our teachers, but now we are opening up an orientation process for all staff that are new to the SU. Um, hopefully, just assisting with onboarding and making certain folks are feeling like part of the team, but well supported as they join our organization um, from all different aspects of the. SU, not just um, licensed faculty. So this is the first year we've expanded it for all, all employees. And today we offered our first ever optional substitute orientation as well. That's right. So it was very lovely and well done by Ken Cole who put it together. So that, um, and how many participants did we have? Did you count hands? I think it was probably 16. Oh, wow. Yeah. 25, over 25 signed up. I so mean, I if you didn't show 16. up, you missed the really delicious Great. food. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, it was I saw in the picture, it looked like a good turnout. Yeah. 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 It caught me that I didn't think you were going to say a number that I, I, I was thinking <laughs> five, maybe. It, it was actually <laughs> really nice because we had it centralized at Royalton, and there were people that substitute not in Royalton, um, and so they were able to meet some of the sub coordinators from other schools. And so, I mean, I don't know that that means they're gonna necessarily answer the phone more, but um, we got some good feedback from our substitutes about what we could be doing better as far as sub plans and things like that, but it was, it was just so nice. So was this SU-wide or just us? It was our, Kendra, Red put it on, but it was SU-wide. Okay. Yep, yep, we the substitute handbook. So we have to share them. <laughs> well, Maybe honestly, we, we wanna share some. We, we wanna steal a few. <laughs> It was a recruiting thing. Yeah, <laughs> we were too all the time. That was a good strategy. <laughs> all right, uh, if there's nothing else for Jamie, then we'll move to the principal's report. Yeah. All right, principal's report. Uh, I added a bunch of pictures. Uh, for elementary, I would just say that we have been working hard all summer. We ended the school year with math training, uh, the new math program we're going to be uh, doing the school year, which is math training. And we, um, sorry, we start the summer with that. We ended the summer with, I just came out of it, two days of OGAP multiplicative reasoning training. So I've done that training and I did the, um, the primary level math training too. So lots of math training going on for our teachers, which is lovely. I also listed out all the other trainings that teachers have on their own um, signed up for over the summer. Like Jamie said, they are working hard and these are things that they elected to do on their own. Uh, we also had our, our Universal PBS team come together for a couple days to plan this upcoming school year and our leadership team, the elementary leadership team, met for two days to uh, work out the details for our school year. Um, other things I would highlight was um, the ad admin team meeting going to the BPA, that's always um, a bucket filler for me and fun to be with our other principals in our SU that we maybe only see once a month, but this is like a nice time to connect with them and see national speakers and, uh, and just remember our why. Uh, and then finally, I put in some pictures from the summer and just kids playing at One Planet at our school. This is me kind of receiving all the boxes. That's what it looks like in the summer. The teacher's place orders and here comes all the boxes. Um, and what the hallways look like. They look beautiful now and shiny, but it's amazing what our custodial staff does when they pull everything out of every room to strip the floors and put it all back together again. Uh, not listed uh, in this that I should have highlighted also is that our SRES preschool playground is getting a, um, a lift and we're getting a new structure for our youngest playing kids. And so that we're getting installed today. I'm hopeful that tomorrow when I go back it's gonna look even better. 
And I think we're also supposed to, be supposed to be highlighting our continuous improvement plan. So we all have to have a continuous improvement plan for the state, um, which is in here in length and you can read in depth. But honestly, it's uh, a literacy improvement and achievement in the uh, intermediate grades is one focus. Continuing math improvement in all grades in elementary. And then just working on attendance and making sure that everybody's coming to school so that they can learn. That's the elementary part of I see that the uh, meals program was, was wonderful. I have to just have to say kudos to Misha and her team and people who aren't even on her team. I know Janet Brown was stuffing bags. Uh, lots of kids went home with uh, weekend meals um, and uh, kids who needed more access. My, to my son took a couple because he's fourth grade. I mean, I didn't necessarily, so I saw what was in them. And I was very impressed with what was going home with kids that needed food. Yeah. I really, I really was. Uh, it was cartons of milk and fruit and stuff, and I really was happy to see what was in that bag. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. I'll go just one step further. Uh, obviously, there's an importance to the sustaining the family through the summer, but the importance of maintaining that contact. Some of the students that would come in to gather, and we're talking 20% of our school was partaking in this program, yeah. um, having that contact with a student over the summer, the impassing, hey, how's it going? Yeah, you still belong here. Like, you can't quantify that, but when you have a food service director that is finding ways to, in a sense, make money off of doing the right thing, and mm -hmm. people jump in to support it, it fits in line with all the, the work you're doing to build a school community. Absolutely. Uh, segueing into the middle school, uh, I'll first start by speaking from the very last best age of outside perspective I have as the new guy. There's a reason our teachers, our educators are taking so much PD in the summer. From the top down, this is an organization that makes that time count. Um, I was at three different conference trends this summer, two with my colleagues, which were by far and away the most productive, even as we were in that burnt out crispy school year just ended mode. Um, by establishing that pattern of getting together with intention, continuing our own professional development, uh, it's created a culture around here. Some of the things we worked on in middle school, in addition to having a team go to best at the beginning, we had teams come together to plan our winter weather <coughs> activities in conjunction with uh, Pico skiing. All of our students will be participating in some kind of healthy lifestyle wellness activity in the wintertime. Something we piloted last year is now 99% codified. And there are several projects like that throughout the summer. Um, thinking about the challenges of efficiency based reporting, shifting to that, we had people meeting, planning out professional development, setting time frames. Uh, additionally, we also had teams that were coming together to align their curriculum, figure out how to support incoming teachers. All manner of facets, uh, up to including today, they were meeting right up until what is traditionally the quote unquote last free day for a teacher's summer. So they truly have been working all summer. Uh, our continuous improvement plan has the same aligned goals. We're looking at how we're improving literacy and math specifically through authentic in intervention, learning the lessons from last year, improving that system, and also in a much broader sense looking at attendance from the fundamental question of how do we make this a place a student wants to be, and how do we assist families in lowering those obstacles to getting here. Uh, out, uh, a branch off of that thought, one of the groups meeting over the summer, continuing this week, uh, where we'll be implementing uh, more than a dozen somewhat personalized learning plans that were increasing the engagement of a student, identifying areas they're strong in, providing direct interventions in areas they need support, um, and looking to create a space, again, that meets needs, really leaning into the idea of flexible pathways as it relates to what we send to Jeff in the high school. Students who are curious, experienced, can build a house, but also design it as an architect. And with that segue, unless there are no questions, any questions. I, I, have, I have one. Uh, sure. One of the, the goal three mm -hmm. is uh, increasing student attendance by 5%. Mm -hmm. Would you say that we have a problem that needs to be addressed, or is that just, hey, we're going to do better? Like, what, what are we looking at for? I think do we have poor attendance, I guess? No, I think both are true. Um, yeah. We should always be looking at that as a way to improve. We want students here. They learn when they're here, right? right. Um, I think if you look at where attendance becomes problematic, where it becomes part of a larger system, DCF reporting, state's attorney, 
That is a very yeah. small percentage of our students. Tiny, yeah. But for that one student who misses 100 days of, of school, that's a lost, essentially, year of learning. And if you think about the calculus of it, the services that have to be in place should the student return to help support them, the services involved, Okay. it's fiscally, ethically, and morally better to have them here in the first place. But, we don't, but we, we, uh, we don't really have a, a truancy problem that is a, a, I would say we have bigger problems that we're solving for kids with social. I think it's been hard for some kids to come back since COVID. I would agree. Okay, I, that, well, I guess that's what was, I, I didn't want to go all little rascals, but I was asking, like, do we have, like, hey, Spanky and the gang are, are cut in school? I don't, I don't think it's like that. But oh, I just, no. I do think that um, for some families, it, you know, I like school. I had a good experience in school. My parents had good experiences. <coughs> for some families, they don't feel that way. And mm. so we're working an uphill battle to try to build rapport and relationships so they feel comfortable coming to school. Oh, no. Well, but, but in reducing it, I just saw it as like, if someone's staying home to be a caregiver for their elderly grandmother, that's a whole different kind of absence than, hey, I'm just blowing off school because I can't stand my teachers and the curriculum. But they're still not learning if they're not here. Oh, oh, no, I agree, but the, the solution that we need to give them and how we need to help them is very different right. from those two people. I just wanted to know if we... I agree, and it's one of the reasons this isn't the salesman pitch. It's me still, like, in awe of what's available here. We talk about flexible pathways, but that concept is much bigger. You mentioned two radically different students on the spectrum of why a student doesn't attend, mm. and yet there are the resources, the intention, and the planning to make some kind of way to engage them. We've had students that are at home for medical reasons. We find ways to bridge that gap. We have students that are fully remote as one of the hubs of the ELC. And we're looking at ways to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. And I think our new homeschool coordinator, Sarah Palmer, is going to be a key in this. Too. I would agree. Well, that makes me happy to hear. Yeah. So you think you think 5% is a, a very achievable goal to reduce? And I think not only is that some of the most rewarding work on a humane humanitarian level. Mm -hmm. I think it's a completely doable goal. Okay. Um, and I think whereas with literacy and math there are a couple of kind of concrete ways to approach that. Mm -hmm. Authentic intervention, creating schedules that support that contact time, investing in your people, the investing in programs and training like the one she just did. Um, sorry, train kind of got a little bit deeper up there. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't ahead of myself. So there are a lot of dis different ways to come at the, the problem of attendance. Mm -hmm. Literacy and mathematics are more discrete, like that's going to be data-driven and measurable. Attendance is where you're going to see more we're making programs that are attractive, which also benefit recruitment. Um, how are we making a place where students feel heard so that they see the impact around them, so that they have a change in overall well, and how are we getting them educated mm -hmm. and how are we getting them accommodated to society as a civic community member okay. like even if they do have to stay home we have an obligation to help them be their best them mm -hmm. so thank you yeah, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent but thank you well, it's an important tangent no student should feel like they, they don't belong here well it's and just it, when you were saying you said five, you said five percent and I'm thinking yeah. geez I'd be really uncomfortable if five kids out of every hundred wasn't getting to school to get what they, so I just put it, my brain put it in that kind of perspective, so I had to ask. Thank you for tolerating my question. Um, I don't think we, uh, It's it's been a little bit difficult, like the, particularly Pierre and Andra, I think you guys are a little further away from the speaker, so sometimes the sound kind of dips out a little bit. Um, so I don't think you kind of talked about this, but one thing with attendance, I know from my family's experience, like we're a lot more cognizant of not sending our kids to school when they're sick. So, you know, I pushing attendance, I think can like, I mean, it's, it is important, but um, you know, I, I think one thing that could help as well is is finding ways to make sure when kids are missing because they're sick or just don't want to you know infect other kids at school like if we can continue figuring out ways to kind of 
keep them involved or whatever. Um, you know, I, like when I was a kid, I don't think I missed a day of school for many years, but I know like given kind of the standards now I would have, cause I was going to school when I had a cold or whatever. Um, so I don't know how we deal with that aspect of things. So is it fair to say in future reports, you would like to hear about what we're doing on this front? What are we doing for students that are missing for legitimate reasons in addition to just focusing on the outliers of that bell curve? Yeah, I mean, I think, like, even if, if all else being equal, just the fact that kids are more likely to miss because they're sick, because parents are more likely to hold them home when they have symptoms, that will lead to increased absence. And then you pointed out the ways that that can harm students. So if there are ways that we can keep them um, you know, up to date or provide additional enrichment while kids are sick or something. I, I mean, I, I don't know a good solution since, you know, like when we had hybrid classes or virtual classes, like that was easy because, you know, they could just attend virtually, but that's not really, I don't think that'll fly now. Um, but I, yeah, so I don't have a solution, but I, it should be part of the discussion. Agreed. But I hate to break it down to this, but with school attendance, it also gives us a chance to see if that kid is getting at least one meal a day because we can give them lunch five days a week. We get a chance to maybe kind of see, does that kid probably yes or no have access to running water? Like, it provides a health and safety element for our most vulnerable in society by them getting that attendance. So we have to shoot for better rather than worse. And I, I again, uh, Andrew said that the sickness thing, I've never been a big uh, 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 proponent of how many sick days you have. The number I always say, oh, my kid could use two or three more because you never know when, because I don't like to send them sick either. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I don't think somebody should m miss eight days. I just feel very strongly that uh, making sure that everybody's included is a top priority. Like I, in, in all honesty, I'm, I'm more with Andrew on the, like, if my kid, I'm like, no, you're not going. You're not going to infect other children. We appreciate that. <coughs> right. <clears throat> so, uh, but, you know, on the, the big picture view, I, I have a lot of reasons why I really like to see kids make it here as much as possible. Even in this hybrid society, I just think it's, it's good for them to, to touch base with people that care mm -hmm. 100%. On a few times a week. I was wondering, <clears throat> like the hybrid, I, I realize that's, that's getting too complicated, but now that we have all of this great technology in all of the classrooms, I know that when I first was teaching with a smart board, I would just save my lesson, and as soon as class was over, I posted it. And so the kids that were at home, were immediately part of the class. They, they could see exactly what we had been doing on the whiteboard. Um, if I used EduCreation, they could hear my voice also. And so it was like they had been there. And then they could email me and say, you know, I didn't understand this part. Could you go over that with me? It made such a huge difference. So I don't know if teachers here are using the technology the way it can be used. But I mean, it's, the potential is incredible. I think that's the charge of our leadership teams is to take this continuous improvement plan and figure out what our goals are going to be and what we're going to do to try to solve these problems. Because mm. it really wasn't an, an issue. It would be literally at the end of class while the kids were leaving and the next kids were coming in, I'd hit a couple of buttons and it would be posted online and, and the kids who were at home, they'd get back to me before the end of the day um, and say, hey, thanks for the lesson. I was just going to say on the topic of attendance or absence. When a child is absent, I noticed with, with one of my children in particular, she had migraines. And so she'd wake up with a migraine, so she'd be late for school or she'd miss school that day, depending upon its severity and how much she had to sleep afterwards. And the labeling of whether your absence is excused or an unexcused absence. How is that labeled? Because most of her things were labeled unexcused. Even though, you know, I'd call and say she's sick. Oh, this is an, un it would show up on the chart unexcused. 
you know, an absence is an absence. So if somebody's having a whole lot of sick absences, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But when you see something that says it's an unexcused one versus an excused one, and you know, you know, I, you don't take them to the doctor usually the first day they're sick. You wait till the second day. So that first day is unexcused. Second day, excused. They went to the doctor. They have a doctor's note. You know, it, it's sometimes bothering to the child to say, well, I was sick that day. Why is it unexcused? Because theoretically, an unexcused absence, if you were in right. high school, if you're in college, you get a zero for the day. Yeah, I, mean, I think... Yeah. What are the, I mean, so what I've been saying to principals is I actually don't care how we define it. <laughs> it's absent, right. I, I yeah. really think what we're trying to get at is is that chronic absenteeism, right? right? Yeah. So we're talking about students who are missing, you know, a lot of research shows 17 absences are going to start to impact student learning. And so what I've asked principals and teams to do is say, if we're getting at a place where a student is missing that much time, whether it's excused or not, right. Right? Like there's definitely folks, students that have chronic illness. Like as teaching teams, we should be meeting with the family as a team, as a support team to mm -hmm. say, what do we need to put in support to make certain that not being here is impeding student achievement, right? And so I think we're just trying to get more attuned to having um, structures in place where our target intensive teams are looking at attendance data on a regular basis. And I've said to them, don't even get into excused, unexcused. Yeah. Look at like how many absences and then look at like how at talk as with the as a team, with the classroom teacher there, how's the student achieving? If not being in the school is in, is what is actually impeding the ability to learn, right? Like it's it then we should be figuring out what do we need to do as a team to have one, either the student feel comfortable, two, because they do have chronic illness, like how are we reaching them, like Andrew's talking about, mm -hmm. to fill those gaps. So I think that is what I think we're trying to do, is not only just decrease, you know, chronic attendance concerns, but also like partner with our families to say, we get that there's a reason why your child may be absent, but we got to still make certain that we're providing so that they're achieving, right? I mean, I guess I'm taking it more from a point of view of like, we signed a couple of stray diplomas at the high school. And I think like, what can we, what could we have done or what can we do in the future to help kids miss any roadblocks? Like anything. Well, well I would tell you that that's a celebration compared to what we used to have. I understand. Where they would have oh, I understand. Out, right? But, yeah. but like, we're shitting here because we're trying to go for perfect, like for them. Like that's what we really should. And like, what do we, so it's not so much that I just want butts in seats. That's no. Nor do I want to pass judgment as excused, unexcused on anybody's social needs, medical needs, anything. My question is just how can we do the best for them? And if if literally I got a call and you said, hey, listen, I we want to fund a, a complete online thing for these five students. I, you'd have my attention, like because I'm I'm just interested in getting these kids what they need, whatever it is. And so it's not I'm not butts in seats. I'm just alarmed at five percent because I worry if they're not getting here. And I have never heard that we have uh, a complete online type thing. That there's still a couple kids out there that are getting missed, and that that hurts. That bothers me. I I don't like to think that. And it actually, uh, the, the, the ones I was talking about, the, the ones I signed, actually they had really good stories to go with them. Yeah. They were successes. Very successful. <laughs> they were people yeah. coming back and, and doing it. But, <clears throat> you know, it makes me think, like, what could we do so that they didn't even have to go through the extra, so they could have. Yeah. Not everyone graduates in four years. Right. The, you know, but it, it, is there long. something we could have done to assist them to be with their peers oh. yeah. on track? And. And you know we probably did a lot with those kids, <laughs> right? Yeah. But <clears throat> which is why I, I really do love the way we, we go about this stuff. But again, I got I got going. I got on a pet thing. Sorry. So you know going last on my report, most everything's been spoken about. But I do want to thank the custodians for their great work. I do also want to say uh, Stephen, our new band director, was here. He's been involved a lot this summer with the Performing Arts Center and that group. 
Our um, counselor, Alex, uh, has been in. Anytime I have a question with a student, a student may email me and ask me about their schedule. I just get a hold of Alex, and Alex is right on top of that. He's been in all this last week, meeting with uh, parents and students on scheduling. We have a new student arriving tomorrow, and he'll be in, and we'll be meeting the uh, parents and student and, uh, for a tour as well. So again, uh, Jamie mentioned about you know, wor worrying about student bur or teacher burnout by working in the summer. And I think you know, we, we, require, we really want our, our student voices, and I think we want teacher voices. And I think doing summer work is a way for teachers to feel like their voice counts. And so I think it's been a good thing this summer with all the meetings that we've had and the participation that we've had and the emails and the conversation. It's a different time to converse than it is during the school year. And it's been really positive, I think, all year. So um, tomorrow night is our community barbecue in the rain. We will be probably having it out front under tents and serving food and uh, doing games in the uh, small gym. So. It, the, we can't reschedule that, unfortunately. There's too much going on for the start of school. So, that's my highlights. Thank you. All right. Unless there's anything more for the principals, we'll move to the business manager report. So, Terry <coughs> um, has taken the week off to recharge. So, um, she was going to join you tonight, and I told her no. Um, and so I can, I believe her report is in the packet. Yes. Um, you know, there's a lot of state reporting year round now. Um, you know, I would say in general, it's, it's a hope that I think uh, many superintendents have and business managers that the agency can uh, strengthen their internal communications so that business managers are not having to continue to provide um, reports that are very similar in nature, that they could then be able to pull data out of reports we've already provided um, to collect the data that they need. So that is not something Tara would normally say under her report. I'm just letting you know if it feels like there is uh, several reports provided to the agency mm -hmm. every month, I would tell you that is absolutely accurate. Um, and often, some of the times that data is similar data. So. I would. I hope that as the AOE goes on their listening tour here, that's one of the concerns I'm going to raise um, to just try to help alleviate some of those pressures on our business offices across the state. And then she talked to you about uh, there's a item uh, for a motion to allow her to provide to provide her with uh, the ability to view your community national bank um, accounts through their online portal, um, and that's where your tax anticipation note is. Um, that is a new regulation that they're requiring us to have the board provide an official motion to allow for that to happen. Okay. It's not a new thing. Uh, we've had it in the past, but she also provided you the suge suggested motion when that agenda item comes. All right, thank you, and uh, policy committee update on the bylaws work. Um, I did not make it to the last policy committee meeting. Um, Rodney's not here. He usually at those meetings too. Uh, Jamie, do you have an update on what the most recent yep. meeting had? They actually, they moved a revised bylaw uh, document out of committee. It'll go in front of the f full board for discussion and possible action next Tuesday. Um, we cleaned up a bunch of language. One of the one of the big things is is that the new revised bylaws will remove the executive board um, for the SU. We have not utilized the executive board in over two years um, because with technology and having hybrid uh, meetings, we've been able to have quorums. So it used to be a concern of quorums, so they would use the executive board. Um, to get work done at the SU level uh, without needing the full quorum of the full board, that has not been an issue. And I just think for transparency and being as inclusive as possible, we should be having full board meetings on a monthly basis, not on the executive board doing some work and then a full board a couple times a year meeting. So um, that's how we've been functioning essentially since I've, I've been here as the superintendent 
and Kathy as the board chair. So they did remove that executive board from the bylaws. The other thing is um, the language will change the voting makeup of the uh, full board if approved by the full board. It would result in unified uh, school districts of the supervisory union having four voting members. Right now, every district has three. That's an operating district. And the one non-operating district, Granville Hancock, because the statute has one. So it would result in first branch, Rochester, Stockbridge, Unified District, and your district having four voting members instead of three. The Singleton Town districts would remain at three and the non-operating district, Granville Hancock, would have one. So we'd go from um, uh, currently a 16-member board um, and first branch, we'd go to a 19-member board. It would result in the need of one additional member of, of the voting uh, board members to be in attendance in order to have a quorum. That's the only concern I've heard raised by any board members is that we have struggled at times to get quorums for like board retreats. We have not struggled really to get quorums when we've had a hybrid meeting. Actually, our attendance has been up over the last year at full board meetings. It has not been down. Um, we've regularly had at least a quorum, but often sometimes even 12, 13 out of the 16 members. Um, has anybody ever, I've, I've had a couple people approach me on this since I've been on the board. Has anybody ever considered that that we run should have higher number than the others because we are the bulk of the SU? That's what this committee was discussing. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems like if everybody goes up to four. Um, well, the other unified district members, we're going to go up to four. Yeah. Um, Andrew, do you want to speak to this? There was a lot of different configurations. Yeah, I mean, I think the issue was um, that due to the quorum issues, they didn't want to add extra seats, which would mean our getting more seats would mean taking them away from somebody else. And there wasn't an appetite to do that. <laughs> so, you know, I put together a spreadsheet that had a bunch of different weighting and whatnot options, you know, like that we could have gone with like waiting by ADM or by budget or whatever. And, um, you know, there were options, but generally it would have involved, you know, some districts having fewer votes and some districts having more votes and, you know, uh, this is kind of the compromise that came out. I think there's uh, you know, the other thing I would just, I, I'm speaking as the superintendent is that I think there is a, for when I arrived, the district boards did not work well together. Mm -hmm. There was not support from district boards to send students to your high school or middle school. Mm -hmm. um, they now see um, the strength in wanting to work together and having interdependence. And I would say to you, I think when you really get a sense of why that was, is that they did feel like um, at times that they did not have as much space or value to share their thoughts because they were smaller than the, some of the larger districts. And so I think one of the things that well, I'm giving you a huge compliments that you've done as a RUD board is that I think at the full board, you have presented yourselves in a way that you want to create interdependence, like work together, and that it's not the RUD board gets to drive the direction of the supervisory union. And I think over time, what that's resulted in is the other district boards wanting to fully support um, the White River Unified District, the middle and high school. And if you look at your high school enrollment data, there's definitely some more RUD students in that enrollment data, but a big chunk of that offset is actual tuition students. Um, and so I think one of the things that I, as your superintendent, had some concerns about when we engaged in this conversation was just trying to keep that momentum headed that we're working together and other district boards wanting to really support the work of this district of recruitment um, and not <coughs> having it result in a thing where we could possibly take some step backs in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. I, that was something that was, yeah, I think when we were going into the discussion, like 
one of the main things was not disrupting kind of the good working of the board that we've had in the past and the fact that they have everybody's been supportive of each other and um yeah so i you know it it's certainly not worth like what would be the goal of it as well like trying to take votes from other districts to get them to ours like i don't think it would really benefit us that much given that you know recently pretty much everything has been done by consensus like there really hasn't been any votes that have come down to like one or two votes where having an extra vote for us would have made a difference like the fact that we're all working together and it's all been consensus makes those individual votes much less important anyway so there's no fight here nobody's fighting we shouldn't worry about it like yeah. just keep not fighting <laughs> yeah we all get along <laughs> And um, I mean, this has just been in the policy committee subcommittee, so we'll see what it, what when it comes to the full board, what the feedback there is. All right. Any other um, questions or discussions? Oh, one other thing uh, that we discussed with that is, like, I don't think these bylaws have been looked at, and since they were initially revised like five or six years ago. So one of the things that we're looking to do is have them be adopted annually at the reorganization meeting um, so that they are regularly before us and we're aware of what's in them and can keep them up to date and revised as necessary. Like there was a lot of stuff in there that was from before any of the towns and um, merged districts and you know was pretty out of date. So I think that'll be a good addition as well. Okay, um, community engagement committee. Uh, so uh, this is the committee that's been working on the surveys um, about how the district's been doing since the merger. Um, we got out a survey um, to all the students and um, all the staff. This is the high school students and middle school students and staff all filled out a um, survey and we got pretty good responses from those. Um, we've started going through that data and looking at um, collating it and making it more usable. Um, there's been a survey that's gone out to families, and um, I think we're going to be looking to, like we've sent out that once, I think we're going to try and kind of reinforce that to try and get a bit more uh, participation in that family survey um, over the next week or two, and then start looking at that data. And finally, we have uh, survey to go out to the community mostly ready um that would kind of be focused on more community oriented things like uh you know voting and taxes and things like that um and that one will hopefully be ready um soon uh we're not going to be meeting this week as we had originally scheduled but holding our next meeting for um basically the week after school starts. Um, so I think the goal is to have a report with all that um, data kind of collated and, and, and put together for hopefully October. Uh, I think that's the update on that. So there Any is questions? no meeting this Thursday night? No meeting this Thursday night. I was supposed to, e or I have an email all written out, just haven't sent it because I was working on the presentation and stuff. So, okay. so. Okay, uh, moving on, we have some action items. Uh, F10 investment policy. Um, we have had multiple readings on that at this point at both this board and the SU board. Um, is everybody familiar with this policy by now and are we ready to act on it? Yes. Okay, um, why don't we do a uh, I would accept a motion to approve this policy. A motion to approve policy F10, the investment policy of the supervisor <coughs> union of the White River Valley Supervisor Union for the purposes of the White River Unified District as well. Okay. Second. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. Um, is there any discussion? Okay, I'll do a roll call vote. Um, uh, Nancy? Yes. Ed? Yes. Julie? Yes. And uh, Peggy had to go, I think. She, think? Yeah, she's going to try to jump back on, but she had to go. She's, yeah. Okay, so I will vote aye as well. So that's a quorum, and the motion passes. All right, thank you, everybody. Now, um, Community National Bank online viewing of accounts. Uh, could we pull up the business manager report to get the motion language? Would somebody like to read that? Motion to allow business manager Tara Weatherill online viewing access to our accounts held at Community National Bank. And I second it. Okay. Uh, I'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Nancy? Yes. Ed? Aye. Julie? Yes. And I'm an aye as well, so motion passes. Thank you. 9-3, um, continuous improvement plans. You could do this as a motion to approve the White River Unified District continuous improvement plan specific to the elementary schools, middle and high school for FY25, and just so the board knows, uh, these have already been approved by the AOE. They actually want them ahead of time. They like to approve them. And then once they approve them and say, yes, these meet our, your needs uh, in regards to Title I requirements, this is to receive Title I funds, uh, then they say, bring it to your board and make certain they're willing to support them. If you were to say no, we would have to go back to the AOE with some revised plans and make certain they approve them first. So I just wanted you to kind of know how this dance with the agency works. I make a motion that uh, we approve the continuous improvement plans. I second. All right. Um, any discussion? Um, one thing I would just note is I, I did see them as links in the principal's report, but it might when, if we're voting on them and for approval, um, it might be useful to have them as separate documents just to make sure that we don't kind of miss them, you know, for future reference or future meetings. All right, any other discussion? All right, roll call vote. Um, Nancy? Yes. Ed? Yes. Julie? Yes. And am I as well? So the motion passes. And the final thing was 9.4, which was going to be um, recording secretary. Right, recording secretary. Um, so uh, unfortunately, Tammy has decided that she is unable to continue being our recording secretary, um, which leaves the position open. So I think the idea is that we would uh, appoint Parker as our recording secretary. So the way that works is that um, uh, we would pay $75 for each um, board meeting that he would do the minutes for. Um, so if we're willing to have that be the arrangement, then um, that would be the plan. Is that all accurate, Jamie? Approve Parker as the recording secretary for the Unified District? Yeah, I'll just add, I did speak to Parker. He's willing to do it. He'd love us to try to continue to search for someone. He'll do it until we find a replacement. He's one for now. Okay. Um, he does several for us at this point. So I told him we would put a little note out and try to find somebody. Do you need a second for that? Thank you. Yeah, second it. Okay, any discussion? Thank you, Parker. Yeah. I guess we'll do it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Okay. Parker can be the recording secretary. And I'd just like to say thank you to Tammy. She did it for many years and um, did a great job. So I really appreciate all that she did over the years and just wanted to put that into the minutes as well. So. <clears throat> all right, um, discussion, board retreat updates. Um, yeah, so the SU board retreat wound up 
not happening um, because of the quorum issue. So, um, and we never really set a date for ours, did we? Um, we did not. Yeah. So, um, would we like to have a board retreat? And if so, when would be a good time? Or we could also say, let's hold off on doing a board retreat this year because we are going to have a special meeting on the 10th and informational meetings in October leading up to the November bond vote. So maybe a busy time. So what, are, what do people think? I, well, I'd say that in conjunction with the fact that I'm about to do the committee that takes more of my time than any other committee, I probably would say I would like to not negotiations. Yeah. Yeah. I would not be disappointed if we did not have one. I would be disappointed if I didn't have Rodney's brisket, but other than that. Rodney can come to my house and make the brisket. I'm not against that. I'll motion to I'll motion to have Rodney make brisket for everybody. I don't touch this. <laughs> well, the question I have, I've clearly never been to a board retreat. Is there anything that has been really valuable in the retreat that we could do maybe before one of these other meetings? Like a piece of it or um, something that you would have missed doing if we didn't meet as like a retreat that we could just add? Yeah. That's a good question. I mean, generally what we do with the board retreats is kind of take a step back and look at kind of the overall, you know, like our, our regular board meetings are kind of generally filled with reports from all the different, you know, principal, superintendent, and kind of have all the issues of the day, whereas the board retreat goal is to take a step back and kind of look at everything from a remove rather than, you know, the month to month business side of things. So, um, you know, that, that, that zoomed out perspective is also being provided slightly this year by your, uh, your community engagement. We're getting somewhat of a picture, like if we had all stepped back from the results of community engagement too. So we are getting a big picture this year from something. Yeah, no, that's a good point. What about, and and the work might actually really benefit from seeing the results of the community engagement sure. work as well. So maybe what we should do is, is table this for now and look, so we'll hopefully be getting the report in October and then maybe we can schedule an extended time to look at it and take a look and talk about kind of overall strategy and results. So like a fall winter board retreat? Well, I, I kind of like Julie's idea of just adding, adding to an existing meeting, but you know, hopefully, uh, you know, generally these discussion items should be like, you know, 10 minutes or whatever, where we're just talking about one subject and then moving on. Like if we had an extended period for, you know, the results of that and kind of our overall plan um, or, you know, st step back, look at the results of that, plus kind of where we've been over the last five years and where we want to go, that that could be um, useful. Um, I mean, the other thing you can do with the board retreats is kind of look at how things have been working and kind of looking at the work of the board and um, like at the SU board retreat the other year, we came up with, that was where we did a lot of the board goals work. Um, and so, you know, that that is a useful thing to come out of it. You know, it's kind of setting goals for ourselves, not just what we want the school to be doing. Um, so that would be the other thing that I think we should include in an agenda sometime. Um, all right. So. Yeah, I guess, um, so I guess those might be two different things, kind of like our board goals, adding that as an agenda item, maybe the next month or two, and then adding um, a review of the survey work and kind of overall district goals or plan. All right, um, anything else on 
this before we move on. <clears throat> then we'll talk about the proposed building project updates and next steps. So um, I think you guys kind of got the intro to this in the dis or the presentation. So what we're talking about tonight, we'll be looking at that um, fi finance breakdown and do we want to do all these different aspects of the project. Um, you know, one of the things that was kind of added this month or just recently was this tech center um, addition. So do we want to do that now? You know, it does make it more expensive and might make the bond vote higher, which, um, you know, might be more difficult to get past, um, but it does seem like there's a need for it. And, you know, I think with all of these things, you know, they, they are kind of separate projects in that they're in separate parts of the building, but, you know, if we have a single contractor coming and doing all the work all at once, I'm sure there is some savings associated with that. Um, you know, that's particularly true of things where they're integrated like you know we can't do the building up our uh, entrance for the high school upgrade and then do the performing arts upgrade and just have them be the same price like that's all integrated so if we did them separately that would certainly add cost um so i guess um i can bring back up that cost yeah I <laughs> I will share my screen again. Um, I should have printed out that matrix, Andrew. Yeah. I forgot to. Yeah. Parker, actually, could you share the um, the slide that shows the breakdown of um, project costs? I think it's slide twenty six. Uh, yeah. If you can. Hi, Peggy. Glad you're back. Um, well, I, I very much agree that it things like that would cost more done in separate pieces than being able to do them all together. I do think that that's true. Having them there to do it, we get a better price to just do what needs to get done if we can do it at that time. Yeah, and it does seem like if we're able to address those these areas that we really would kind of get to a point where you know we've kind of addressed the glaring issues with our building and i think we've been at a pretty good place and it is unfortunate that we wouldn't be able to get an auditorium because you know that would be ideal but i don't think that getting one is realistic so this is kind of as close as we can get and solves a lot of the issues um, short of that um, I, I can't quite I can't make see it, it up. Very well. Is there a way to blow that up? Yeah, there, there we go. Okay, so we're talking $385,000. For the wood shop. Expansion. Yeah. yeah. I'm... It, my first thought is anybody that was against this to begin with will be against it afterwards and vice versa. I think anybody that was going to vote against the bond. I don't think that this will sway a lot of people. I think the people that were supporting these endeavors will support them with that. And I think we won't lose many people over wanting to put extra into the tech. In fact, I feel that we may even gain yeah, some uh, so. support by saying, hey, we're fixing up the tech too. Because now we've got, uh, we're taking care of the music kids and we're taking care of the tech kids. So, I mean, and, and it's not like we're adding millions. 300,000 300, is quite reasonable for what we're looking at and adding it to the bond. I think if we just keep the public aware of what we're doing and what our logic is, I think it actually could help with the bond vote if we inform them correctly. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I think that's true. I am a little worried just looking at the bond schedules that um, Tara had had gotten. You know, when we were originally talking about it, we were looking at you know like a two or three million dollar bond, in which case the bond payments were going to be 
less than the old gym bond payment. And so we were going to be able to do it without any sort of tax increase um, beyond like there being like one year where it was going to be double payments. And then after that, it was going to be equivalent or less. Um, right now, it looks like we're looking at, um, you know, the, if we do do like a $4.7 million bond, then the principal and interest payments are $322,000, which, you know, is $100,000 more. So that what about is offsetting some of the uh, tech center with a little more capital improvement fund. That would be doing. Oh, that yeah, would be doing. Already yeah. Okay. Looking at that $2 million. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think if we can clearly, like if we can fundraise, like part of it is that the performing arts center is, is more expensive and, you know, I think well, you're, hoping, well, you're hoping to get like a full third of it. Not that we should depend there. on this That's stuff. Good. I've never said we should be comfortable depending on boosters, but sometimes that gets things done. Maybe we could get uh, some kind of booster situation started up and get some momentum on the tech center improvements and uh, have a fundraiser for that as well. Yeah, I, the tricky part is that we are running short on time. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we need to have a decision made basically on the next. On the oh, oh, or, or, or a grant of some sort. I know, again, we're short on time, mm -hmm. but we did apply for the COPS grant, which mm -hmm. would have offset that 642000 but um, I would by yeah, six hundred thousand, but we haven't heard back. Have we looked at tech center grants? Grants just for well, we're not tech. tech. No, no. But is there grants out there that you mean specific to put tech stuff yeah. into uh, like STEM schools, improvements, major spaces like, grants? Yeah. But instead of a three D printer or or a loom, you're just talking about again going back and having a, a jigsaw and a and the, I don't know, an engine degreaser or whatever we've got in there. Um, I mean, I, I guess I'd hate to see it not go in there because I really think that it's a good time to do it. And I think it's really going to benefit a lot of kids. And we have the, and we have the oil issue, too. We have where the oil tanks are going to get uh, done anyway. So it just seems like it's a very tidy solution right now. Go ahead, Julie. So my bigger picture thinking is just um, last town meeting, there were displays about the Performing Arts Center. And, you know, before I was on the board, I thought that that was the only thing that was being asked of taxpayers. And now it just seems kind of scattered because it's more than just the Performing Arts Center. It's this and this, which I don't think is bad. I just feel like your average taxpayer um, if we could get the word out more than just it being a performing arts center, that might throw some people off if they think it's just for the performing arts center. Right. Yeah. And, you know, so the other thing that we need to discuss about our approach here would be um, when we do go for a bond, we have to do the bond for the full scope of whatever the project for the bond is. So another approach that we could do is say, use, um so like we could go for a bond for the full 6.7 million dollars and that's what people would be voting on but then we would tell them you know we're going to have this amount of fundraising and this amount of whatever so the actual amount that we're asking from taxpayers is this amount you know that's not the 6.7 that's just what you're voting on like we're actually asking for 4 million or 3 million or whatever it would be um alternately we could try and use the other funds for some of these other things. Like we could use, um, kind of break the project up into smaller projects and do them all at once, but um, fund them differently. So say, do everything except for the Performing Arts Center using a combination of grants and um, the uh, Building Improvement Fund and I don't know if we could use like there is fourteen thousand dollars worth of savings there. I don't know if we could use like a lease 
for those savings on the fuel switch. Like we could do that. Yep, because because this is performance contracting, we can have multiple um, funding sources. I I've confirmed this with our attorney, uh, Andrew. So we could certainly say that the bond vote, let's just say if the board decided like we want to do some performance contracting, like leases, like you did with the current boiler, mm -hmm. you could go ahead and do that for the fuel switch upgrade, the rush, the retro commissioning of the control system. Um, so that way, and you could say fundraising that the boosters are doing or it's going to cover the ECM4. The upgrades to sound lighting and stage access right and mm -hmm. you could decide like we're gonna just bond ecm1 and ecm5 right because you got to do the storm water and we're going to use capital funds to do the other ecms mm -hmm. am i making sense like that's what you can do that your bond vote will actually only be on whatever things you decide you need to bond for you can Pull this apart if you choose. And then still get everything done. Yes. To me, it would make sense to pair up the Performing Arts Center and the work job area for the bond vote and pay for the other stuff out of the capital fund. Yeah. I mean, that does make sense. Uh, my worry about doing it that way is that then it seems like you know, these are the, like, we're basically asking for the optional things and they make it more optional, you know what I mean? <laughs> As opposed to like, if we have everything all together, then it's kind of a package deal that people are voting on, um, as opposed to you're voting on the performing arts. Center. And to some extent that is true that if the bond goes down, like we're gonna have to figure something out and some of the stuff will get done and some of it won't. Um, but, you know, certainly what things will look at it like is going to be much different um, if that vote doesn't happen. Yeah, like some of these things definitely will happen regardless, but um, yeah, I'm not sure what the best approach is. I see your point, I think I well, it's not our only. I think our best recourse is to to do one vote, but also work very very hard to show everybody the value in the decision. Yep. Or or, or take or take select stuff off to to lower the bond vote, but for the most part, still use that same strategy, just with a lower bond vote and a little bit of more of a hit to our capital fund. Yeah, I do wonder, like, if we, um, I probably should have talked to EEI people about this, but, like, if we could have, basically do what we talked about just now of having the um, bond broken up into different pieces and then having kind of a lower cost version of the of the project that we would do the bond for, but then be able to like if we're able to fundraise an extra however much then we can do the current version of the performing arts center um with that difference do you know if that's possible jamie or once you have a bond are you kind of stuck with whatever project you bond? yeah so um when the when the voters vote on the bond the way the article is actually written is it'll specifically say here are the things that the bond's going to pay for in general, it's going to talk about performing arts. Center. It'll say if, if the board chooses, like, you're going to have to make a decision, like, you're going to do the gymnasium right. as part of the bond. Because like, the of language is like to expend up to this amount or something like that, right? Yes, to extend up to this amount to do these things. So we couldn't expend more than that if no. we decided to change things. Correct. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, like, potentially we could maybe, yeah. If we wanted to, like, if the, we thought that that 4.1 was more than voters were willing to bear, 
like I wonder if it would be possible to break out the entrance part of that, which is you know all still the same project, but like if we could break out the cost of that particular part of that and just bond the other part and then have that part come out of some other funding source. It's a little difficult because kind of I think the extra money that we would be getting would be for fundraising for the performing arts. So well Andrew, how much did you say you said that there was going to be a difference between the um current gym bond vote and this what's the difference in that and could we just take that off so it stays the same for taxpayers uh you mean oh yeah that is another option so if we have building reserve funds you can use those to pay bond payments as far as i am aware right jamie I got to confirm that I don't know that for certain. Right. So, you know, that could be an option is like we take $400,000 of the thing and say, we're going to use that to pay the first three. I mean, maybe that's not even enough, but, you know, like the first X number of bond payments and then they come in later or whatever, or pay down a portion of the bond payments if that's an option. So that may or may not be an option. <laughs> I'll check. I'll make certain, and I'll share it with all of you. Okay. Um, you kind of, regardless of what we do, we're definitely going to have to work hard on getting the word out and educating people because, you know, um, it would be good to have a great turnout for this vote. And, you know, we're going to kind of naturally get a good turnout because it's during the presidential election. So I think there's gonna be a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily turn out normally for school votes to that'll come and and be voting and then have a have this ballot as well. So um, so we need to make sure we're getting that information out to as many people as possible. Um, and I, you know, no matter how we structure it, there's gonna kind of be some difference between what the total amount that you're voting for and what we're kind of actually looking to spend um, from the bond. So um, so what do people think? Like right now, how are you leaning? Are you leaning towards kind of what we discussed before of basically doing the Performing Arts Center and the workshop together as a bond and then everything else out of like maybe a lease for the things that have savings and the rest out of the um, fund, uh, the whatever it's called fund, uh, continuous or capital improvement fund. I mean, I'm, o I'm okay with that as long as all these boxes get checked and we get all of these things that I feel are important either for health and safety or for our students, then yeah. Yeah, I, if there's a way to do that and make the bond more palatable, then we certainly should. Yeah, Peggy? Well, when I'm looking at this, most of those things on the list are related to the Performing Arts Center in one way or another. We do a Performing Arts Center and then you get your secured entrances at South Royalton, you're probably not going to do one without the other, or the secured entrances are going to be completely different than what we plan. Well, what's listed as ECM three is just the entrances in Bethel. So, and it, yeah, but um, I mean, we've talked about new the you know a new high school entrance or something because you were saying basically right. state guidelines. We need to do that anyway. So that should. Yeah, I mean, we're not required to do that. Is the thing. It's like yeah. you could just stick with the current one and. Yeah, but I'm, now the addition to the workshop, doesn't that also go along with the Performing Arts Center? Uh, it's on the back side of the building, so it's kind of completely separate. So the only, okay. only way that it would affect the kind of other projects would be that it would increase. I don't even know if it does increase the impermeable surface that we have to deal with, with the stormwater abatement. Basically expanding. I mean, the, the, the stormwater improvements is basically we've got to do that regardless yeah, whether yeah. we build a performing arts center or not. Yes, but how big it has to be depends on how what happens with the rest of the project. 
Yeah. Like we do have to. I, I just see it. everything is being so intertwined in some way or another. It's hard to pull out some projects without changing the scope of things. And if we take a look, if the bond fails, then how does that, you know, it just seems to affect things down the future if it fails for a lot of these things that we want to do. Right. I agree with that. Um, you know, I think if the bond fails, we're going to have to kind of redo everything from scratch anyway. So I don't yeah. know if it matters if we're asking for a six, you know, if we ask for everything in the bond versus if we ask for a smaller bond, because if it fails, we're going to have to kind of go back to the drawing board and figure out another plan. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of debating with myself here whether it's better just to bond everything and then we, you know, ed educate that we're going to be not using that full amount for, um, for all the, you know, funding or if we try and make the bond as small as possible to make whatever sticker shock there is less and make it more likely for it to pass. I think they, I think it's going to be sticker shock regardless. That's true. I'm worried that that so far all anybody has heard about is the Performing Arts Center. And so if they don't come to any of the informational meetings or if they miss out on something like this chart, then they're going to think, whoa, $6.436 million for the Performing Arts Center. Whoa. Uh, to me, because when we were first talking about it, you were talking more like, wasn't it $4 million? Yeah. It just, yeah, well, it gets up there. Yeah, the, the 4.1. Um, I don't know. To me, there seems to be a big difference between six and a half million and, and 4.1 million. I think the important question was, is were we going to get the 4 million approved? And are we jeopardizing it by asking for the six or are we losing no voters? And we should just ask for the appropriate amount. And if it's turned down, then we have to go back to the drawing board, just like we would have if we got rejected on the four million dollar yeah. yeah so and and like i said the a lot of this stuff shouldn't be argued with stormwater and so and the additional thing is just us giving another subgroup of kids what they need we're catering to the tech kids we're giving the performing arts center to the music kids because and then and then even so the music shows that the tech is the right move because when we build it they come so if we have a better tech center more kids will become engaged and we'll have more tech students doing better things out of the school so i, I mean i'd be i would not be ashamed to ask for the entire thing as a bond but i understand that we may have to shape this to make it more palatable to uh, the day-to-day -day voter because that is a big number. It's a shockingly big number uh, that most of us can't even imagine having our hands on. So, um, you know, they're both they both very hard to, to swallow. <laughs> your boxes. So, really, yeah, I mean, them, us telling them what what they're getting is probably the best the best thing we can do. Just getting it out there. Go ahead, Peggy. Well, I was just thinking when we go for a bond, if a bond fails, you're allowed to do one more vote in the year, right? Right. In which case, then you'd look at the bond that failed and say, okay, if we take out this, this, and this, and we'll use other funds for that, then you could go back and show the voters you've cut this and we'll pay for that another way. And we'd like you to vote on this for a bond. You can yeah. cut it the second time. I don't know how that screws up the timeline, but that way you could go back and say, well, we've taken this, this, and this out of the failed bond. Will you support this? Right. When you yeah, say, the, I, when you say the second vote, 
um, in the year, does that mean in the fiscal year or in the calendar, calendar year? So we'd have to get the other vote in in December. No, 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 no. I mean, from the date you vote, you can only do one more until that actual date comes back. Again. Oh, okay. From November 4th. So from November, November 4th. 4th. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, that's what I was trying to <laughs> So we could but it does seem like we probably would want to do it in December. Yeah. Well, oh, I, I could possible. do it relatively quickly to get back on track, which is what I would you, think. You, is, yeah. you won't be able to do it in December because of the warning, probably. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh -huh. but, January, February. But definitely, but in January. Okay. Okay. And that, I don't think, uh, and I don't want to speak for EEI, but I don't think that that would throw the uh, everything off cataclysmically if we were. A month or two behind that's not what i'd like to shoot for but i think all this could still happen if we mobilized afterwards so maybe we should ask for the correct amount yeah right i'd be in favor of doing that considering that we could do a second one if we needed to um i guess the other i mean i what i was just thinking might be a good approach is you know like it's always kind of been referred to as the performing arts center and anytime, like, I think it might be awkward having a bond vote where it's like, do you approve 6.7 million for the Performing Arts Center, Library and Science, HVAC with heat pump, dehumidification, secured yeah. entrance, I suppose, you know, like it becomes this really long list. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if we came up with a different name for kind of the overall project, or, like the Performing Arts Center has always been kind of how it's referred to. So if we do a good enough job of educating people about what that means and that that means this whole thing. Um, we call it capital improvements. The bond's still going to, the language will still have to mention those other things, but. Yeah. but well, maybe, yeah, that is like, like we, we refer to it all as one bunch, but then we have different funding sources. So like in whatever we do, like, I, I kind of think it is better to ask for a smaller bond. Um, and like, you know, whatever, whenever we do it, we're going to have a slide that's going to show like, this is the total amount that we're asking for. This is how much is paid for by um, capital improvement funds. This is how much we're bonding. And this is how much we're um, getting grants and fundraising. And so it'd basically be the same thing, just like, you know, the number that we vote on is just going to be a smaller thing in the list of, like, it'll just say. Uh, your presentation and all your information could show all the ECMs. You would yes. just say we're paying for all these other ECMs this way. Your mm -hmm. bond vote is going to cover ECM one. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, I mean, yeah. I mean, if we're referring to the whole project as the Performing Arts Center and like what they're voting on at the bond is the performing arts center <laughs> and the performing arts center project includes all of these things but the yeah basically yes that's that's what i'm thinking um on a separate subject how much do we want to use out of the building reserve fund and how much do we want to keep in the that was on those forms that like if we have 2.1 million dollars to work with what are people comfortable using versus leaving. Didn't we talk about this at the last meeting? Didn't we say 1.5 million or something like that is what we felt comfortable using? Yeah, and that is if we're able to do the retro commissioning and fuel switch through a lease, everything else adds up to 1.53. Yeah. So really? that seems like a good approach. Andrew, I was wondering, like, what, what do we pay for interest on a bond, and is it really worthwhile to be paying interest on the three hundred thousand here and the three hundred fifty thousand there? Like in the long run, are we, you know, instead of just spending the money from our fund? Yeah, that's where I would like to know how this would work. So, if we did do the full bond for six point seven million, like, would we basically just immediately pay down two million of it? with fundraising and you know the money that we have in our capital improvement fund in which case we're not earning interest on that stuff anyway or like would it would it change what we wind up paying in the end um i, I don't really know what the answer to that is how that works with paying bonds early 
You, Jamie? Um, I, I'll double check again. My sense is that once we, we, you can, I do think you can, you can use the capital funds to pay off, but I, I don't think you get out of the lease payments. I think once you're locked into bonding, that's what you're locked into. So in that case, we definitely do want to go with a smaller number because. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, yeah, my advice would be that you do what you just said, Nancy, is that you're, you're really seeing the, like the entire project's going to do all these things, right? Like you can talk about mm -hmm. the large project, but I think you can also say, we're only asking you to bond 4.1 million out of that entire project. Yeah. That's, to me, it makes sense. Yeah. And, and uh, but are we in the same informational release? Are we allowed to tell them, Hey, look at we're getting $6.4 million of stuff done. And we're only you asking you for, because I mean, that's, what makes it very strong as an argument, like, hey, look, we've got this part covered. Okay, I, I mean, I like the sound of that. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, we still, like, even if we did all of the currently proposed GM upgrades with that 350,000, like we still have $150,000 extra fundraised funds plus whatever else comes in. So how does that work? Do you know, Jamie? I think it goes toward your bond payment. So we just put it towards bond payments, but it wouldn't like be paying down the principal early or whatever. We just correct. Okay. Well, that's actually not bad because yeah, there was going to be like if we look at the recommended or the projected bond payments, like I think there are a couple of years where it would overlap. Yeah. And that would help with that. Yeah. Which I think it'd be good to show people that. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I think that would be really strong for some folks. Like we know we have a few years overlapping, but with fundraising, the bond payment, like we have a slot. Yeah. And we should give this a unifying name for all of this, like, I don't know, the District Education and Safety Construction Project, we'll call it DESK or something. I, don't <laughs> I like it. Yeah, that's pretty good at eight. You, know, <laughs> you must only want to know. But no, it's, it's, it, it should have a nicer name so that people say, yeah. uh, one, that sounds pretty, and two, hey, tell me more about it. Like, because yeah no that's a good idea um why don't people think of things and if you have suggestions send them along and we can yeah work on that um are people available on september 10th for a special meeting to finalize the amount that we want to bond Yes, I'll make myself available. Yep. What's up? You ready for the last question? Board meetings. <laughs> Jeff said he would go for it. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. If everybody, if everybody here can make it, then we at least have a, a quorum. Hopefully, hopefully, get more. <laughs> go ahead, Peggy. Well, I've, um, I was just saying, we're planning all of this. We need to make sure that we keep Carmen in the loop because she's, of course, is the new district clerk for all of this stuff. So she, besides planning for the regular elections, then she's got a plan for this bond thing too. And when she spoke with me the other day, nobody had talked to her about a potential bond for the school. So she was kind of clueless and wondering what was going on. So we need to make sure she's in the loop and making sure that, I mean, th this will be her first time as the school clerk, so. Right. And Jamie had um, brought up when I talked to him earlier today, um, you know, we uh, do have options for how we would want to do the vote as well. I mean, it's Australian ballot, but we could mail ballots to everybody if we wanted to, um, you know, given that it's with a, presidential election, my inclination would be that we just hold it with the presidential election. And since 
the ballots aren't being mailed automatically for that. Like, don't mail them automatically for ours. But if people request absentee ballots, we'd want Carmen or um, Pam Brown to make sure to ask if people want this bond vote absentee ballot as well, so that you don't have people missing it, thinking that they were, you know, they got absentee ballots, so they were fine and not realizing that they needed to specifically request a absentee ballot. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. You know, thank you, Peggy. And that was on my list to do once we, we, I felt like the board gave some real direction around doing it. Okay. Um, anything else on this topic or do we feel like, I, I feel like we kind of have a general plan for what we'll do on the 10th. Um, you know, I think as much as you can talk to people and, and get feedback, on what the town would approve or you know um what they think about this project i think the better off we'll be on the 10th so got a couple weeks if you can get any feedback or whatever go ahead piggy well i was just curious um the the school support group has raised has got pledges of five hundred thousand dollars so i'm assuming that five hundred thousand is coming in as a lump that we can invest while we're paying off the bond so we theoretically if that's something we can do we sh should be able to have interest income from that that goes towards paying off the bond too am i right i don't know <laughs> question well, it depends, right? Like if you earmark it for ECM uh, four, like that's 350 of it gone. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like just fundraising in general, you know, that's a single pledge that we're talking about, but we're hoping that we're going to have more than that in the end. Correct. Um, so if we do wind up with like, Four hundred thousand dollars that's going toward the performing arts center. Um, presumably, we would have the flexibility to put that in a. a fund. You just passed a policy. That's right. Now we can. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not going to get a huge rate of return on that because it's yeah. <laughs> invested to retain principal. So. Well, and yeah, and you know some of these items, the cost will start coming up within like short term, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not going to get any cheaper. Right, no. but um, yeah, okay. It just depends on how much you fund, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Okay, I think we have a plan. Um, is there any last things people want to say? Okay, um, then we're back to public comment, um, and we don't have. Yeah, one public. Person in public. I, I do have one question, um, Alex Hansen. I, okay. I am a resident of the district, but I'm also a reporter at Valley News, and so I'm asking partly because I know there's another reporter listening to the meeting. We're working on a story, and there's something that's not clear to me, which is if you do reduce the bond amount that 4.1 million for the performing arts center are you are you able then to keep the tax impact level because that's closer to the amount of, uh, of the gym bond or are you still going to see the hundred thousand dollar increase that andrew was talking about yeah so we would still see an increase but i think the thing to keep in mind is that uh Hundred thousand dollars for us is approximately a penny, which is a good clean number. Is that fair, Andrew? Um, yes, and I think it. I'm I'm hesitant to say what the actual tax impact would be because I think it depends on what, yeah, like what we have for fundraising and, um, you know, the overall payment would be increased at the four point one level from what we're currently paying on the gym 
bond, but what we're actually asking from taxpayers might be different depending on, yeah, the fundraising totals and how how it all gets structured in the end. Whether you receive any grants. Right, exactly. Right. So you're, you're clearly still sort of at the round numbers stage, I think is the impression I get. I just wanted to get a sense of that round number that you were talking about. I think it's it's too early to kind of say like I think we could come in about the same or it could be a little bit more or you know we'll, we'll have to wait and see a little bit longer. We certainly have those projections after they take action and we're like moving toward information. People are going to want to know. Yeah, we'll definitely have kind of as concrete tax impact as we have in advance of the meeting. Very good. Okay, um, is that any other public comment? Go ahead, Peggy. Okay, this is a question I wanted to ask before I had to leave, but we were talking um, about all of the work that the teachers have been doing over the summer and, um, you know, the time that they've put in. When I was teaching, in order to get relicensed, you had to have X number of credits before you could be relicensed, plus whatever hoops you had to jump through. And I was wondering, do all of these things that the school is offering during the summer, do those also go towards the teachers' relicensure credits that they they may need, or is, or am I showing my old fashionedness? No, because anything that we provide. I mean, we're really tying teachers up a lot during the summer. Anything that is related to professional development, they absolutely get relicensure certifications and or even sometimes credits to move over on the um, pay scale. Oh, okay, good. Um, okay, uh, new hires resignations. Uh, we had a hire the last time we met. Mary Grace Johnson will be joining the Bethel campus as the Bethel, um, one of the Bethel preschool teachers. I don't think it's good. Yes, I forgot about it because Mr. Thomas had a, a hire. We did hire Dylan Otis, he will be, um, Team teaching with Mr. D. Simone on the South Royalton campus. He'll be teaching math and science, replacing Laura Levitt. Laura's going to be Laura, high school, yeah. school science teacher. Wow. Oh, yeah. well, that's exciting. Oh, yeah. He's doing fourth and fifth grade, right? You got it. Yeah, okay. And, and I, I got the letter the other day for my little guy. <laughs> Andrew's laughing too because yeah, the, the, new guy, the new guy has two board members' kids in the company. It's going to be great. Yeah, we're disappointed not to get Laura as 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 the fourth grade teacher, but um, hearing that she's going to teach high school is, is great. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we have any other at this time? Don't think so. Um, future agenda items. Um, I think lots of uh, bond stuff, um, but I think we've talked about those already. Um, so our next meeting date, we're going to have a special meeting on Tuesday, September 10th, and then our um, and should we do meet them at 7 p.m. as usual, or uh, does that work for everybody? 7 p.m. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Is 7 p.m. Folks feel like that's the best time to engage with the public. I don't know. I'm just asking. So I'm just thinking it's one of these things we want we're gonna want to advertise. I think the more we can get people coming, the better. We may want to go a little earlier than seven if we want. Oh well, actually, I don't know. We've had people complain that it was too late, and can people complain that it was too no, early? I so I don't know. I I but I I'm I'm sensitive to both. If we did it at like six, maybe more people would come because it wasn't late, but then it's in the middle of dinner time. But then it's in the middle of dinner time. I'm not I'm not sure where the sweet spot is for such an informational thing that nobody is inconvenienced. Yeah, I mean I I don't 
foresee the September 10th being much about information, but more like, so I, I don't think we should do another informational presentation. You know, I think this. Wait, you know, I guess, what's, is, is it going to be a lot of attendance? I guess is what. I do think it's worth letting people know you're going to talk about it. I think the more we can like, get some buzz, the better. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, telling people to come and give us feedback before we vote is useful. Um, yeah. But I wouldn't advertise it as informational. Um, so why don't we keep it at seven? I think that that's a good time. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, do we want to do it at the Royalton campus or um, SU office or Bethel? All right, we should do it. I think you should do it at this school. Yeah, let's do it at Royalton. Okay. Could you do like a tour in advance? And like talk about all the different places so people could like see what it looks like now. Sure. I don't know if that'd be helpful. We we did that at Sharon. It was helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think we definitely should do that during informational meetings. Again, I don't know whether we count this as an informational meeting, but we could have. I mean, maybe after the tenth, could. I'm trying to think. It, it, could we have like an open house kind of thing where we could have a guided tour and we could point and be like, "This is happening right here," and if a reasonable amount of people, like you know, we could walk 20 people around and say, "Hey, this is," and we we obviously wouldn't be able to do the whole thing because we two different campuses have projects, but we could we could walk them through Royalton or even have another day here and be like, "This is changing. This is changing. We're making this better," and then maybe they'll feel more engaged. And more more likely to support the bond. Or maybe have the meeting start at seven, but say six thirty for people who want a tour. Oh that, yeah, I don't know if thirty minutes before the meeting would be enough. Well at least to see the performing arts part of it. <clears throat> Those posters up. Um well, why don't, uh, I guess we can talk about that further um, in advance of the meeting, um, Jamie and principals, I guess. Yeah, and, and we can also, e you guys can email when you're planning an agenda. Yeah. Okay. So you can, as a board, talk about these types of logistics via email. Okay. Um, and my sense is that the value news is going to do a nice article on this and we're going to find that in the meetings moving forward we're going to have more attendance about this topic yeah okay mm -hmm. all right so september 10th 7 p.m at the royalton campus and then tuesday september 17th 7 p.m at the royalton campus okay I would have to motion. Move. seconded all right adjourning at nine